Të ndëruar të rëshikues, mirë serdët në emisionin Bashkimi Evropian dhe ne të cilin e kemi shvendosur sot para ndërtesës Bashkimit Evropian këtu në shkupi cili është edhe institucioni mëjë rëndësishëm i cili këndjek reformat integruese të vendit në Bashkimin Evropian. Në brendin e këti institucioni të të marim përgjigjet e shumë qërshtjeve të cilat nga preokupojnë kohëve të fundit dhe të marim përgjigjit e atyre nga personi më i lartë në këtë institucion, pikërisht ambasadori Bashkimit Evropian në Shkup, Zoti David Gjerë. Your Excellency, when we discuss about the European integration of North Macedonia, almost three years have passed and we are still talking about the Bulgarian demands. While in the meantime, the reforms somehow seem to have fallen into a second plan. How much does the change of that focus affect the reform agenda? Well, Nora, thanks for the opportunity to join the conversation. And I, I think your question points to a really important issue which is the process of joining the European Union is about reform, a process of transformation in virtually every sector of uh, uh, public activity. Uh, it's an intensive process, uh, and we are accompanying the country on its way. And there is no shortcut. Uh, reforms need to be implemented in all of these sectors. Why? So that when the country joins the European Union, it's first of all resilient and competitive in a very competitive environment, which is the EU, including its internal market of 450 million people. And secondly, as a member state, that they can really then enjoy the benefits of membership. So, as you've heard, I'm sure, many times, the way to the EU is through, through reforms, and there is no shortcut. Now, I, I agree with you that uh, the discussions on, on the, uh, some bilateral issues, also on the Constitution, but also the focus on dealing with the economic crisis, dealing with the energy crisis, means that sometimes the space to focus on reforms has been more limited. But, you know, governments are complex animals. They should be able to deal with, across different agendas, all of those questions, while at the same time advancing on reforms. Because this is the central point. By advancing on reforms, this country gets closer to the European Union. But more importantly, those reforms are in the interest of citizens. After all, citizens, they want to see you know, the fight against corruption advance. They want to see a rule of law state. They want to have clean air. They want to have jobs. Uh, uh, all of these things which are part and parcel of that reform process. The European Union screening process uh, should end in November this year. And the government says that about 45% uh, of the legislation is harmonized with the European Union. In which areas do you expect the biggest problems to be located? So the good news is that the screening process is processing, uh, progressing very well. Screening is basically bringing together the experts from this country, from the government and from, from the administration, together with experts from the European Union, having a look at what the EU standards are and how f what steps need to be taken by this country in order to bring the country to the standards of the EU. So that's a good process, progressing well, very serious. There are many challenges in the process that I've just mentioned, but I think uh, one of the most important areas is already highlighted in the new methodology that we've adopted for uh, the process of accession. And that says that there are certain issues which are so important that they need to be addressed throughout the entire process, from day one until the very end. And these are called the fundamentals, and they include the fight against corruption, strengthening the rule of law, but also the public administration reform. So these areas are going to be difficult, they're going to be challenging, but first of all, it will be clear what needs to be done in each area, it is already clear to some extent because we publish annually a country report and also we and other members of the international community will be accompanying it throughout each step of the process. But there's another challenge I think which is perhaps even greater and which is not really about screening or about laws, that's about the big picture. We have seen with other countries that have successfully completed 
the accession process, take for example Croatia, that what tends to happen is it works because the political parties come together and agree that the goal of the country is to move forward on the accession path and therefore they will cooperate on ensuring that the relevant legislation is moved forward as rapidly as possible. Doesn't mean they have to be in a coalition together, they can still be government and opposition, but that they're working very clearly with the key goal to bring about accession to the new European Union as soon as possible. All Western representatives constantly repeat that specific steps are needed uh, for fighting the corruption you mentioned. What exactly do you mean? Can you give us an example? And uh, is there any corruption case uh, in the country that honestly shocked you? You know, there are plenty of steps that can be taken. I mean, you just take, for example, the very good reports from the State Audit Authority or the State Commission for the Prevention of Corruption. There are many recommendations there which need to be implemented by government and which in some cases require the intervention of the public prosecutor. So there are clearly things that can be done there. And yet we saw last year that the State Commission for the Prevention of Corruption, only 10% of its recommendations were implemented. So it's a good place to start with those recommendations. Of course there is much more. There are a large number of cases going through, which were formerly from the Special Prosecutor's Office, which are going through the courts, which need to continue their path in order to ensure that justice is achieved. And we need to see actions from all sides of government, parliament, and for all players to move forward on corruption, uh, combating corruption. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, the recommendations are there. I think it's clear what can be done to improve the situation on the ground. What shocks me? You know, actually, and you read many things in the press, it's not the big cases that come up every so often which are shocking because they occur in many societies. What I find most shocking is when I'm talking to people in different parts of the country and they tell me, well, this job I applied for, I was qualified for, basically got it, but I didn't have the right party affiliation or there was something else I was required to pay a sum of money. I don't know whether they paid the money or not. But these kind of daily experiences of corruption, which I think people are quite familiar with, um, those are truly shocking. Uh, difficult to challenge, but they can be challenged. The thing about corruption, it sometimes seems to be impossible to change. But if you work together by individual steps, such as those contained in the recommendations, uh, you can really overcome it and change the environment uh, or which uh, tolerates certain levels of corruption. But uh, the authorities say that they are fighting corruption, but the problem is in the, we know, in judiciary, who has low trust among citizens and is prime target of criticism. Do you share this opinion? What kind of uh, reforms should be made? To be clear, the judiciary is one aspect of the fight against corruption. There are many others and I've just outlined those. Uh, obviously, uh, we follow very closely the area of the judiciary. I always like to say, and it's important to say, that there have been some positive developments over the past years. Not all judges are corrupt, as is sometimes, you know, you hear in the press. Um, there are some you know, courts doing their daily business in a way that you would expect them to. Nonetheless, of course, we, we are concerned. We do expect much more in terms of progress in the area of the judiciary. And that involves all of the different institutions. From the beginning, when we have the Academy of Judges, which is of Justice, which is supposed to help train up judges and prosecutors to the highest standards. So we need to make sure that they're truly doing their job and that entrance is on merit and success is on merit through to the different institutions themselves. How the courts function, we're providing very substantial support there, but also the Judicial Council. The Judicial Council, as you know, has been in the news a lot. Its job is to protect the professionalism, integrity uh, of the, and impartiality of the, um, of, the, of the judiciary. What we've seen recently has obviously resulted in a complete collapse in credibility uh, in front of the public. That's an issue of concern. We need to look at how to 
strengthen that institution so it's more transparent, so that it's, um, if there are, where there are cases of uh, people trying to interfere in the Judicial Council, either for political or for financial reasons, that liability there, criminal liability is much clearer. So it really starts to operate as one would expect of a Judicial Council, which is there to protect the rule of law. There is a responsibility on judges themselves also to act in a way which enhances public confidence and the rule of law. And there are other places, players such as the Association of Judges, which can contribute to that, as well as other civil society actors whose job is to monitor and make sure that the courts are doing the job that they should do. So there's a long way to go, much to be done. We will support, continue to support the process. This is an, uh, you cannot go around this, these reforms have to happen if you wish to progress to the EU. You mentioned some, pro some of the problems and it was my next question about uh, the political influence. And uh, I want to know, do you have any um, ways to solve this? Uh, do you think of any, do you have any ideas to solve these problems? Well, first of all, it's not for the EU to solve these problems. Yeah. The, the solutions have to come from within and I think solutions to these issues are a range of things. It is clear instructions from all of the political players that the judiciary, you do not interfere into the judiciary. But there is also financial interference as well which needs to be dealt with. It means institutions which are robust and whenever there are instances of this they deal with it very decisively including if necessary through criminal proceedings through the prosecutor. Um, uh, uh, and it also needs the judges themselves to say, look, we are not going to allow interference in our, in our looking at individual cases. We will judge the cases on the merits and on the basis of the law that is there. That is a culture change. That is a, a, a lot of reforms which need to be done to do that. But it's achievable. This is not a big country. Um, this reform is possible, but it needs very um, clear political determination uh, and professional determination to deliver. Let's return to the main acute problem. It's obvious that uh, there is resistance in the Macedonian society, especially among the ethnic Macedonians, for the uh, constitutional amendments and the inclusion of the Bulgarians in the constitution. What if the changes are not passed? I think there are two issues. Is there is, yeah, what, our what? focus. Okay, so first of all, there is the constitutional change itself. Yeah. Obviously, this is a sovereign decision for the country to take. I think there are a few considerations which are important when politicians and when the public are reflecting on how to act. Um, first of all, I think it's important to look at what, when it's published, what the precise text will be. We understand that it's obviously to include people who self-identify as Bulgarian in the constitution. And in a way, if you like, that is making explicit what is already implicit within the Constitution and consolidating what is already a good record on inter-ethnic relations in the country. So in itself, it does not seem to challenge the national interest or the sovereignty of the country. I think it's also important that people step back and look at the big picture. What we see at the moment is a very special moment. We see a momentum, partly due to geopolitical developments related to the Ukrainian war, uh, the, the war on Ukraine. We see a momentum uh, in, in uh, Europe, an intensification, an increased seriousness on the enlargement process. And momentum, you know, in politics and in international affairs is something you do not miss. Also for this country, that momentum translated last year into the opening of accession negotiations as it was for Albania. The next step in the process does require the constitutional steps to be made, but no other further, no further decision, no veto. And so there is an opportunity now to move decisively forward, decision for the country to take, but looking at the big picture, if the goal is accession to the European Union as soon as possible, well, the way is open. And the focus, as you started this interview, should then be on ensuring you get there as fast as possible through reforms. What happens, you said, if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't progress? If it, yeah, uh, it's the main problem. 
What happens if? I think uh, if it doesn't, if if the constitutional changes are not implemented, then the process will will halt there. The screening process will presumably close, and you'll not move to the next phase since this was the agreement reached last year, and this is also part of the bilateral agreement with uh, Bulgaria. And the president of uh, opposition party, Vamroda Pomane, Christian Mitskovsky, proposed that the changes be adopted now and that they become valid after the country's entry into the, the European Union. Is it somehow a compromise to accept the changes? I think it's been good that there have been discussions between the leaders and that the discussions should take place between the parties because, as I've said, this is a national interest, this is a national issue. It's not, a, it's not a party issue, it's even, I might say, a European issue. So it needs, there needs to be this kind of discussion. When you look at the Council conclusions from last year, last July, it was clear that it refers to the completion of the process of the adoption of the Constitution. So completion, I think, is exactly what it is. It means what it says. It means that the inclusion of Bulgarians into the Constitution and their application immediately at that stage. The Macedonian authorities hope that the country can become a member of the uh, European Union by 2030. How likely it, it is the country's membership in the Union by the end of this decade? Last week uh, you will have seen the Presper Dialogue Forum in Struga yeah. uh, and that event basically was posing this question 2030 mission possible or mission impossible? Somebody no less than the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, said definitely it's mission possible. And we believe that very firmly. If the country embarks on the reforms, then the way forward and accept acceding by 2030 is possible. The path is clear, it's very realistic and it's achievable. But in order to do that, as I said before, you need two really critical factors. One, this political unity across the divide so that things move at top speed and secondly that things really do move at top speed uh, in terms of the reforms themselves. Then the date is, is possible uh, and realistic. Without that, no. Uh, the public opinion survey conducted by the American International Republican Institute last year shows that support for uh, Euro European Union membership for North Macedonia has fallen from 90% in 2010 to 73% in 2022. How do you comment on that? Well, I Did think I understand, that, uh, I understand uh, you know, some of the concerns, frustrations and emotions that people have been expressing in the public uh, in public discussion uh, you know they had expectations that accession negotiations would open earlier that was delayed and there have been a series of vetoes and I think they are frustrated because they want to join they want to see progress in this area and that has also in in sense you know undermined confidence in the process of going forward but again I think it's important to step back and I would say two things here first of all there is a renewed momentum. There is an opportunity now, I think, to move forward decisively in this area. And secondly, North Macedonia is sitting not just on the edge of Europe, but actually with almost within the borders of EU member states, along with the West Western Balkans. The EU is the big economic magnet next door. The EU is proposing collective uh, responses, collective solutions to some of the big challenges of our time, climate change, or very recently European Parliament on uh, artificial intelligence, um, on other technological and innovation questions, the, the challenge that you see between uh, economically between some of the big blocks around the world. So the EU is the big player which is right on, our, on your doorstep. The opportunity is there to join the European Union, to be part of that, to be able to influence all of those issues and to have the protection that comes with being part of a big bloc. So I think the logic for the country is overwhelming that notwithstanding some loss of confidence, I think you know, this is the direction which is the best bet for the country 
in terms of stability, democratic, its democratic future and its prosperity. Of course, it's a decision for the country to make, um, but I think the, the interests are very clear. Do you have uh, any message to address for the citizens that are watching us, any daily message for today's interview? What I would say is that the road to the European Union is, is clear. The steps that need to be taken are realistic and achievable. Don't believe anyone that tells you that reform cannot happen. It can. But it does need to happen. So in order to progress on that path, in order to join the European Union, these reforms need to step and, and need, need to progress. And that involves everyone, I think, playing a role in that. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be part of this TV show. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Këtu edhe përmbyllim këtë edicion të emisionit Bashkimi Evropian me dhene dhe shpresojmë që të kthejemi në këtë institucion me përgjigje sa më pozitive dhe shpresa për një tardë me më të mirë të vendit në Bashkimin Evropian. Mirën beqët!